How many grew up in church? Grew up, you know, around church a fair amount. Uh, yeah, yeah, grew up in church. I did. I grew up in church. My parents were pastors when I was growing up. Uh, we lived overseas on the missions field for a while. And uh, uh, we'd been in ministry my whole life. Uh, I, I went to Bible college. I was homeschooled through uh, most of high school. So, yeah, shocker. Uh, <laughs> That guy looks like a dork. Okay, so uh, I was homeschooled through through most of high school. Went off to Bible college early, and, and uh, uh, I, I was in Bible college. I, I took my first full time pastoring position uh, as a youth pastor at 19 years old. So I grew up in church. I grew up around church. I grew up around my grandparents' church. Was a lot of old people, uh, more of a traditional PAOC church in Eastern Canada. Uh, I just I grew up around church, and I, I remember the old controversy. Uh, and we don't hear about this as much anymore. In fact, we just said, uh, you know, this isn't the culture of our church. We, we don't hear about it at all at our church, uh, I don't think. But, uh, uh, and we're not that old. We're only a couple years old as a church, so it's, we don't have time to hear this kind of thing. But I remember the old controversy growing up about, you know, you would talk to an old person about church and they would tell you how great it used to be. I don't know if you grew up in church around those kind of environments where they would tell you about, oh man, I remember when we used to sing the good old songs and we used to, you know, every, every, every message was, was on the rapture and, 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 and like just this kind of, and I don't want to say old school theology is, is the wrong term, but the old school emphasis on, on insightful or meaning uh, 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 good theology, but just kind of a different type of emphasis back then, uh, different types of songs. Of course, hymns were a big deal. Every song at my grandparents' church was sung out of a hymnal, it feel like it felt like for the most part, and, and which not a bad thing. I'm not bashing hymns or anything. I love the, the especially the theology and the old hymns, and there's some good stuff in there. But I remember that you would hear old people talk about the good old days, the good old days, how it used to be, what what it was like when maybe they were much younger and they could hear the songs that were being sung on Sunday morning. You know what it was like back at a certain point. Now, my name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline, and just so, so excited to be with you as we continue the series that we've been in called Beyond, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just really uh, excited about this series and today specifically. And one thing just I wanted to let you know about today is that uh, we are going on our first ever missions trip. Who's excited? Uh, mild, a few of you are mildly excited. That's very encouraging. So, so if we're going on our first missions trip as a church to Mexico, uh, July 20th through 27th. And so it's not too late to sign up, but soon it will be. So you can get signed up on our central hub, uh, ridgelineashville.info, and uh, we'll get you all the information coming up. The price of the trip, we, we try to keep it as, as cheap as we possibly could. One of the reasons why we decided on Mexico uh, is uh, because we, we knew it would be as a first trip as a church, this would be cost effective. And we, uh, it's $1,200, and that is all-inclusive. And so uh, food, lodging, everything from the time, you know, we leave until the time we get home for the most part. So that, that is, so don't miss out on this trip uh, uh, and be a part, because we're going to see God do some amazing things. We're partnering with Glasses for Missions. So one of the things we'll be doing while we're there will be a lot of, you know, meeting people's practical needs, which will open the door for us to also uh, have an opportunity to meet a spiritual need for them as well. We'll be doing some, some services and some, uh, I believe, some healing services and some evangelistic type services and, and really uh, going after uh, the lost and all that. So you don't want to miss this trip. This is going to be an amazing, an amazing trip. So uh, now, like I said, I grew up in church and I would hear this phrase, uh, it ain't like it used to be, or it's the good old days, or, or you know, uh, and of course, that was always referring to a style of something compared to what style it is now, and and uh, I, I remember years ago, I, I, like I said, I went to Bible college when I was 19 years old. I went to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, and, and I was there for a few years, and, and, and I remember getting out and being in ministry uh, after I graduated, I think it was about 2003 is when I got out, and, and it was a Several years later, I'd been in ministry uh, uh, for about five or six years at the time, and I remember just being really desperate for for God to move. For I remember being really desperate to see God do something that that was greater than what I was currently seeing. And I and I kind of and, and so what I did was I I, I, I knew that sometimes old people ha have these great stories about how it used to be. And so I, I found I was in a prayer meeting one time and I, I found an old lady and I just asked her about how it used to be. Because I, I just wanted to hear 
about how good God had been to her throughout her life and some of the ministry things that she had experienced because I felt like if I could just hear about that, it would give me some hope again for, uh, for God to move in a powerful way like I'd seen him do even in my own life at, at Bible college. So she began to tell some unique stories and talked a lot and it was very encouraging. It was very encouraging. So there's a portion of scripture we're going to look at in a couple of minutes where we begin to see some of that mentality seep into what's going on. But as you know, today we're taking up our uh, build a place offering at the end of the service. And, and what we're doing, we, we feel like God has given us a place God has given us a, uh, a future location that will be our own and whatever. And so uh, even though we, we don't yet have any paperwork signed or, or anything like that, we're still in negotiation. We're still working out some of the details. Uh, I feel like the Lord has spoken to us about being a good steward and to be ready for the opportunity when it comes. What's, what's that old adage or expression uh, that uh, luck is when opportunity meets uh, preparation? Right, And, of course, we don't believe in luck. We have the Holy Spirit, so we don't need it. But, uh, but we want to make sure that we are prepared for, for when the opportunity comes. And so we've begun the process of, of setting aside money and raising money for, for our future location. And, of course, you know, last week during our service, it became pretty obvious that, that it'd be, it, we need a place. Uh, as we were doing uh, some healing ministry and, and, and as our service begun to run later and later and later and, and as we were, I'm, I'm trying to pray for people for healing and, and people are being healed and, and, and I'm looking at my watch going, we have to be out and tore down in like 30 minutes, right? And there's a lot going on and it became very obvious last week. It's like, man, we really have got to get this worked out. We've got to, uh, and I just want to give a huge shout out to our setup team because man, every week they come in, they set up, they tear down and they're so you guys give it up for our setup team. One of the reasons why we need our own facility is to do uh, events throughout the week. See, we're very limited on our time here, and, and I don't mean in any way to sound ungracious to, uh, uh, regarding the, the Seven Day Adventist Church. They've been more than, than wonderful to us, and they've, they've been good to us, and so I'm not, I'm not making any kind of statement about that. But, but we would be able to have a place throughout the week to do maybe a, a first Wednesday service or a, or a, a youth group or, or some other things like that, some bigger events, uh, uh, maybe concerts or, you know, whatever, and and uh, new events that we don't, we're not currently doing. Of course, if we have our own facility when we come, like this year will be our fourth annual fall festival. Uh, and it'd be so nice to not have to go rent somewhere to do our fall festival and love on the community. Just we have our own spot. We need a new uh, location because it will help us to better love and serve our community. A new location will help us better love and serve our community. It will help us uh, serve better some of the homeless population in our area and, and uh, different types of people who are broken and, 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 and need help and, and whatever. One of, the, one of the ideas that my wife and I, Crystal, have been, been throwing around for our new location is to have a fully functioning full-time coffee shop that's open during the week. And one of the things that would be specific, uh, we would be needing the need, needs of those who love coffee, but also, uh, a little more significantly, but also, which is a lot of y'all, uh, but also, what if we had a coffee shop where everyone in who worked there was trained to recognize uh, people who were dealing with either depression or anxiety or su su suicide? And so, so, you could, so people would come in and get coffee, but then the people making the coffee were, weren't just baristas or, or people who knew how to make a good cup of coffee. They also knew how to be aware of, of the mental status of the person that, they, that they, was there in the coffee shop. And so they could start a dialogue back and forth and actually minister to the people and share Jesus. Wouldn't that be so cool? Somebody just walks into a coffee shop not expecting anything and they leave, their life is transformed. 
I believe it's important for us to have a location because I, I believe it, it, it's putting a stake in the ground that's saying this, we are Ridgeline Church and the enemy is not going to stop us in the community. Uh, is like we're, we're, we're declaring to the community that we're here, we're here for you, we love you, uh, we're about you. We, we, we want you to understand and know who we are and what God has done in us and through us and what God wants to do in and through you as well. And, and I believe when we have the opportunity to kind of uh, put uh, a stake in the ground and said, this is Ridgeline Church, this is us, and of course, I know we're the church, but, but in a location setting or sense, uh, I believe we're declaring that our best days are ahead of us as a church. And I believe we need a place to be who God has called us to be as a church. Remember last year, I was doing some coaching, and, and, and one of the things, some some pastoral coaching and training, and uh, uh, one of the things that they encouraged us to do was, was to really kind of uh, pray about who we are to be as a church, and, and, and I knew, like, as far as vision and mission, I knew that specifically, because I feel like God gave us that before we even launched as a church, but, but as far as what that looks like, or, or how that plays out, or, or those types of things, it was, it was like, you know, what, what, who are we as a church, and so he, here's a couple of those things, um, to be who God has called us to be. The first is, I believe we're called to be a presence hub as a church. A presence center. A presence hub. A place where the presence of God comes and meets people in a powerful way. See, I believe that God knows how to meet every need of every person. And the local church is his extension into the community to do just that. And here's, here's what I love, and we've talked about this so many times, but I'm going to show you the scripture it came from. You see, what, what I, I believe we're called to be a presence-oriented church because when we see the kind of the template for church throughout the Old Testament, we see that Israel camped around the presence of God. In fact, Exodus 40, it tells us this. It says, in all the travels of, of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, and in the sight of, the, of all the Israelites during all their travels. Now this is such a neat portion of scripture that has become really a part of my heart and, and, and what, what, what is the DNA of our church is that we are called to be a church that camps around the presence of God. We camp around the presence of God like Israel. Number two, the thing I believe we're called to be is a healing hub. A healing hub. A place uh, our city can experience God through in healing and in restoration, both uh, physically and emotionally. This is who we are called to be as a church. And, and we've seen both in our church. We've seen people get healed emotionally through, through different discipleship small groups and through the freedom curriculum and through, you know, different types of prayers and, and, and you know, just working and counseling with people. But we've also seen people get healed in their physical body as recent as throughout this week and last week. Last week we prayed for people to be healed at the end of service and we saw uh, 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 three knees, a shoulder, hip, a hand, and, and then I've heard about a couple other things going on is that, that need to take more time uh, to really to feel out the extent of the healing and, and, and different things like that. Some intestinal things and some other things that people are still testing and seeing how it's going. But, but, but so far, they've expressed massive progress compared to uh, before we prayed for them last week. Isn't that amazing? Isn't God good? We are seeing physical healing in our church. Amazing. So good. We saw some emotional, some kind of, we partnered with some um, emotional healing this week when we were out in our uh, evangelism explosion small group and we were out with telling people about Jesus and, and, you know, asking people questions about God and getting a survey for how people, you know, think about God throughout our community. And, and we ran into two different couples that have had uh, pretty uh, momentous events happen in their life within the last, like very recently. 
And while both of those couples knew Jesus personally, had a relationship with God, they were hurting and they were broken and they were going through some stuff and we were able to come alongside them and pray and speak truth and speak life and minister to them. So I love this healing hub thing. In Luke chapter 10, there's this great story. Jesus tells a parable about the good Samaritan which it, to a Jewish person would be an oxymoron. Good Samaritan. Samaritans were half-breeds. They were, uh, they were ha- only half-Jewish. And, and so, uh, they, they, but they were like, uh, they were regarded as, you know, Jewish people were very racist towards Samaritans. So Jesus tells this parable called the good, that we call the good Samaritan. And so there's a man, he's traveling from Jericho to somewhere else. And, and along the side of the road, he, 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 as he's traveling, some, some bandits come out and they beat him up and they take his money and they take his clothes and, and they leave him on the side of the road for dead. And then, and then a, 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 a priest comes by, uh, one of the priests comes by, and, and instead of helping the man, the priest crosses over to the other side of the road, and, and, and he goes on with his day. And here, here's, the, here's the, the kick. We, we know that, you know, you wouldn't, you know, we would say, well, how come he didn't help this man? Well, I think Jesus' point wasn't that he didn't help the man. Because uh, I think most of the audience hearing the parable would assume that a priest wouldn't help the man because a priest is not allowed to come, come in contact with, with a body that is so mangled that much. It, it wouldn't be. And, and, then, and then there's another guy who comes by, a Levite uh, from the tribe of Levi, and, and he comes by and he does the same thing. And, and it's almost like Jesus is making this point, like, like the, I, I don't think it's a... I don't think to them culturally they were saying, you know, like that's a big deal. He just avoided the guy. The guy was good for dead anyway. But then a Samaritan comes and actually gets his hands dirty and helps him. They're going to like, wait a minute. Like I get that the other two may not help him. But a Samaritan certainly wouldn't help him. Of course, the point of the story is about who's your neighbor. And so the Samaritan picks up the man and he takes him to an inn takes him to an inn, he leaves some money with the innkeeper, and he says, listen, I have to keep on my travels, but I will be back in a couple of days. Will you see this man through to healing? Will you make sure he's well taken care of, make sure he's bandaged on all of his cuts and bruises? Will you make sure that he's got everything he needs so he can heal, and when I come back through, if it's cost you any more than what I've given you, I will pay the remainder as well. You know what I believe? That in this story in this in this uh, kind of illustration of 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 God and, and neighbor and, and, and the kingdom and all of these things that Jesus is trying to communicate I believe that the church is the inn I believe that the church it, the inn represents the church and that the church is supposed to be a place where people who are broken and beaten and he, uh, and, and bruised and, and in need of healing and because of the the world because of those around them because of their own sin choices because of whatever's going on in their life that the church is the inn where people who are broken and battered and torn and bruised can come and receive healing. In fact, St. Augustine said it like this. I love this. He said, the church is a place of healing. The church is where people who are wounded by sin can experience Christ's healing grace. Number three, the creative hub. I love this. A little bit creative. I try to be. I like to be creative. I believe that is uh, us as a church are called to be a creative hub. A place where creativity, the creativity of God is expressed through the arts. And I don't mean just we write our own music. But a, a place where the creativity of God is expressed through the arts, through, through things that maybe, maybe there are those of us in the room who have a book inside of us that's yet to be written. Or, or maybe there's those of us that are painters or, or craftsmen or, or dancers or, or there's some philosophy or, or there's some strategy for, for advancing the kingdom. There's, there's different ways of expressing our creativity. I love this Exodus 35. It, 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 it says this. It says, uh, this is what God did. It says, he 
filled them with skills to do all kinds of work as engravers and designers and embroiders in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linens and weavers, all of the skilled workers and designers that God has given us gifts of creativity. I believe our church is called to be a hub for people who are creative. I love, you read a lot through Genesis, I think it's uh, 25, and uh, I mean Exodus 25 and Exodus 35. There it talks a lot about the creativity that God has given people with as they're in the process of building the temple, or not actually building, putting together the temple because at that point they were portable. And so there's this portion of scripture that reminds me of where we are right now as a church. And in some ways it feels a little kind of in between. It feels like where we are right now is we know we're not, uh, you know, experiencing everything that God has for us. But, you know, we're just kind of getting going or, or you know, we, we were past kind of our launch season. But, but we're not quite where we're going to be as a church. And so it's kind of this weird in-between feeling. At least that's how it's been for me. And there's, there's an excitement for what God has done. And we're grateful that we've made it this far. And, and we're, we're glad for everything that God is doing. But there's also a sense that we are on the verge of something great as a church. So we're going to be looking at a, a scripture in Zechariah today. But let me tell you the backstory before we get into this scripture. See, the Jewish people, the, the Jews were captured by the Babylonians, and Solomon's temple was completely destroyed. Have you ever seen the, the like Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and Solomon and all that? that that's the, kind of the era that we're talking about, uh, uh, that era in history where Solomon had built this enormous, beautiful temple for the Lord. Because of sin and, and the Israelites turning away from God, there, there is, um, uh, there is a, uh, uh, the, the people have been scattered and <coughs> there's a, you know, there's a lot of, stuff that's happened in their history and, and they've been taken over by other nations. They've been, and so Babylon, uh, they were captured by Babylon. Solomon's temple was destroyed. This is about 586 BC. In 538 BC, about 50 years later, they start to return to Judah. And, and this is where we see the books Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament. They're prophets, and they, they start to rebuild. Uh, Ezra is about the people returning back, and, and Nehemiah is about, remember, Nehemiah about rebuilding the walls. This is all through this portion of history. And, and so, uh, and then we, they start to rebuild the temple, as, as we see in the books of Haggai and Zechariah, and, and under the leadership of a man named Zerubbabel, and under the leadership of, of uh, Joshua the priest. Now, this is not Joshua from like, you know, from after the predecessor to Mo or the, the after Moses. This is this is a, a different Joshua because we're several hundred years now uh, past that time frame. So Zerubbabel, who was appointed, uh, is appointed governor over Judah. And they spend about two years rebuilding the foundation of Solomon's temple. And they begin to see. Then because of some, some uh, opposition uh, by some Samaritan settlers in, in, in Judah, the project of building the temple gets delayed. The project of building the temple is completely delayed. And it's specifically here where we see a lot of the majority of the books of uh, Haggai and Zach, uh, Haggai, excuse me, I, I said it Haggai as a kid. And so now I say it wrong like my, every time. I say Haggai, it's Haggai and Zechariah. And, and so this is where we see kind of their prophecies and, and their kind of uh, uh, prophetic leadership uh, kind of take place in the history of, of uh, Israel in the books titled titled after their own names, Haggai and Zechariah. So we're going to pick up the story of Zechariah chapter 4, starting in verse 1. I love this story. It's so good. It says, Then the angel of the Lord who talked with me 
returned and woke me up like someone awoken from a sleep. Have you, have you ever been woken up? This morning, I was in the shower, and, and I set the soap on, a, uh, on one of the ledges in the shower, and then I turned around to do something, and the soap f- slipped off the ledge and hit the floor of the tub, and it was so loud, and I jumped, like in the shower, I jumped, and not only that, my wife is asleep in the, you know, our adjoining bedroom, and it woke her up too, like, and, and then she was very, you know, frustrated that, like, she woke up so suddenly, and so this is, like, what, what, I, what Zachariah is saying, it's like, you ever been, like, you're in this kind of daze of like, why, why, who, what is wrong with you? Like, why would you, yeah. So this is Zachariah, this is what he's saying. Uh, I returned like one, uh, um, and woke me up like someone awakened from a sleep. And he, he asked me, what do you see? And he said, I, I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Verse three. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I asked the angel to, who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And, and so here's what, here's what Zechariah is seeing. He's woken up from his sleep, or feels like it, and, and he begins, it, it, the angel's there that he had previously been talking to in chapters 3. And he begins, the angel says, what do you see? And he begins to describe this vision or this trance that he's in. And he says, listen, I, I, see, I see a lampstand. And, and then I see a bowl. And, and I see two olive trees on each side of the bowl. And then there's seven channels going from the bowl to the lampstand. And so here, here's what's happening. There, there are two olive trees. There's a bowl sitting between the olive trees. And so what do olive trees produce? Olives, right? So the olives would fall out of the trees and fall into the bowl. What do olives produce? Oil. So, the, so as the, the olives begin to decay and, and, and get rotten and the, the oil would seep out of the olives and it would go down into the seven channels and the seven channels is feeding the, 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 the channels on the lampstand where the seven candles are, whatever's burning on the lampstand. And, and so it'd be this continual flow where the, the, where the lampstand would be able to burn without ever stopping. Without ever stopping. So, so there's these two trees. They produce olives. The olives fall into the bowl. The bowl uh, with the olives produces the olive oil. The olive oil uh, is fed through the channels. And, and the, and the lampstand is burning with the oil that is constantly produced. Constantly produced. So it runs. And it runs and it burns and it burns. And he answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. And he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And then what he does is he doesn't explain the vision. I love this. He doesn't explain the vision. But I think he he doesn't explain the vision because he doesn't need to explain the vision. uh, uh, Zechariah would already know exactly what's going on here. He just doesn't know what what the illustration is supposed to be. And so he continues. He says this. He says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. I love this. So good. See, Zerubbabel was the civic leader of Jerusalem. And he had the responsibility to finish the work of rebuilding the temple. And the work had stalled. And Zerubbabel needed encouragement to carry on the work that had stalled. He needed some encouragement. He needed some direction. He needed some guidance. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks to Zechariah, the prophet. And he says, this is the word of the Lord for Zerubbabel. And he says, it's not by might, or in other words, focus on collective, which focuses on collective strength, uh, the resources of the group or of an army. It's, it's not going to be like that. It's not about the might. It's not about how, how your military power is not going to see this into completion. Your, your ability to kind of ha- put a think tank together and strategize is not going to see this unto completion. And he says it's not by power. Focuses on the individual strength. 
It's not going to be your own ability to do something or someone's just going to have a great idea one day. It's not by might nor by power. It's not it's supposed to the individual strength. God says, not by the resources of many and not by the resources of one, but by my spirit is how this is going to come to fruition. It will not be your cleverness. It will not be in your ability. It will not be your physical strength that the temple will be rebuilt, but it will be by my spirit, says the Lord. I believe this is for us as a church. And I don't mean in a general sense, like this is the template throughout the Old Testament. We see a template for the church that Jesus comes and establishes. And I don't mean like that. I really got a sense in my spirit, the more that I dug into these portions of scripture, that this was for us. This is where we're at. As a church, we feel like we're in this in-between. We're in this in-between. We get to be a part of what God is doing right now in our city, but also we're preparing for what God is going to do. And I believe it's gonna be even greater. And I believe that our best days are ahead. And I believe that it's, it's not by our might that, that we, we, we do, our, uh, it's not by our power. It won't be about anything that we do. But I believe as we begin to do our part and take on our responsibility, we will then see God do his part, which will be most of it. Which will be the big part. You see, the Israelites, they, 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 weren't, they weren't not working or not trying to rebuild the temple. They just kept coming up against opposition, coming up against opposition, coming up against opposition. And so they weren't saying, you know, God wasn't saying just sit back and relax. But he was saying what is going to break the opposition won't be anything of your doing, it'll be my doing. And here's what's happening. Here's what happened. During the rebuilding there was a group of older Jewish Jews in Jerusalem that began to talk about the good old days. During the, during the rebuilding of the temple, there was this group of, of people that were, they were a little bit older and they, they remembered how massive Solomon's temple was and how beautiful it was and all the gold, and all, all the trinkets, and all, all the decorations, and it just how, how and, and the temple that they're rebuilding now, just like, it wasn't quite the size, and it, it wasn't quite, quite it, they didn't have the resources to do everything that Solomon was able to do, and it wasn't going to be the same. It was not going to be near as beautiful, it wasn't going to be near as lavish, it wasn't going to be quite what it used to be, and not only that, it wasn't, they didn't even have the ark, they hadn't got the ark of the covenant back, so, the, so what represented the presence of God wasn't even going to be in it. The ark's still been in, in captivity. begin to get this ideology, this mindset that the former, I believe some of them, the former was it's greater. But it happened in the past. I mean, those were the good old days. But there was also maybe this grumbling because I think for a lot of them, there was this tension between the returning home and their homes need to re be rebuilt and their lives need to be rebuilt and their families need to re be rebuilt and everything about their lives was in chaos and disarray and they're just now coming back to their spot and, and now they're supposed to build the temple. The Haggai, prophet, he, this is what he says to them. Oh, I love this. He says, the glory of this present house will be greater glory of the former house says the Lord Almighty and in this place I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty the glory of this present house will be greater than the former what I'm about to do what I'm doing now what I'm working on now will be greater than what you've seen or what you've experienced before and, and here's what I love about this if you know anything you know the rest through history you, you know that this would be the temple that Jesus himself would walk the steps of 
That Jesus himself, Haggai says, that this will be a place, and in this place I will grant peace. And this was the exact temple that Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, would come. We see in Luke 2, Jesus dedicated this temple. So today we're taking our build a place offering. We got the scripture from Exodus chapter 20, or we got the, the name from Exodus 25, 8. It says, if you have them, build a place for me, I will come and dwell in it. And the place that we're building, it's, it's not about the who. It's, it's, in a lot of ways, it's about the what. It's, it's not about us. It's not about so we don't have to tear down church every Sunday or set up church every Sunday or so we, don't, you know, so we can have a, a, a nicer uh, place that meets our needs a little bit better. It's not about that. It's about building a place where God can encounter, where people can encounter the presence of the Lord like they've never encountered him before. And here's the tension you may find yourself in today. Maybe if you've been in church, you grew up in church, and, and maybe you've, you've driven by this, this building on Airport Road, and you look and you go, well, that, that's, not, that's, that's not even a very nice looking building on the outside. And, and I, I mean, you know, compared to the churches that I've been in in the past, I mean, it, it's, there's no steeple, there's no stained glass, there's no whatever. It just seems like, and, and you're comparing what God is doing now to what God has done, and you're saying, I, you know, I've been a part of church plants in the past. I've been a part of churches that are getting going in the past, I, you know. And you know what, compared to, uh, compared to my church or my parents' church or the church that I came from, whatever, I, I don't know. I've done this before. This can't compare to that. Or you may be like the other group. It says, you know what, I, just, I got so much going on right now. I've got so much going on right now between, between work I mean, and school and kids and life. And it's just not like financially, it's just not a good time for me right now. And it's just, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. There's so much and, and every, all the bills and everything that I'm trying to pay for and everything that I'm trying to uh, work out and everything is just not a good time for me right now. And you know what uh, uh, Haggai said to the Israelites who had that complaint? Haggai said to the Israelites who had this complaint that it's just not, it's just not a good time for us right now. He, he said, your lack of priority for the house of the Lord is the reason your life is in disorder. He said, if you would get your priorities in line, your life would fall into line. That hit me hard this week. <laughs> I mean, my life's fine, but my, my wife's life is really what I need to get in order. Um, I'm just kidding. She's not in here, so this is our secret. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. We'll be doing a reverse offering today. It'll be hush money. Like <laughs> I said, and what I'm going is speaking on behalf of God and what I'm going to do in this house is greater than what you've seen heard before and here's the deal we have an opportunity as a church to build something and I don't mean buildings I, I mean legacies something great something that is not about us or, or even uh, necessarily even for us although it will be our place but 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 a place uh, but a place where people will encounter Jesus why because as a church we, we declare often that Asheville shall be saved Asheville shall be Saved. I, I love this. This this is uh, Solomon writing, and he, he this is his attitude while he's building the the most probably the most beautiful building ever built in history. He's building the first temp, uh, temp, uh, 
tabernacle that, that later on is destroyed by the Babylonians. But, but this is his attitude when he went to build uh, this, temp, this tabernacle for the Lord. I love this. He said, the temple I'm going to build will be great because our God is greater than all other gods. He said, listen, what, what I'm, the, the, the mentality that I'm going into this building project with is that this thing has to be amazing because it represents who God is. It represents God and God is so good. But who is able to build a temple for him? I mean, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter how nice everything is. It will in no way compare to the glory and the splendor of God. And he says, but who will be able to be, uh, build a temple for him since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him? It doesn't matter how nice, and listen, I, I want to build the nicest thing that, that, that I can build for God is what Solomon's saying, but it doesn't matter how nice it turns out to be, how amazing it turns out to be, who can even contain God? Just be a representation. Who then am I to build a temple for him? Who then am I to build a place for God. When you think about this scripture, and then you think about the prophecy of Haggai that the that the current will be better. Even though it's, it doesn't quite look as nice, even though it's a little bit smaller, even though we don't quite have all the resources, what what what, what God is doing now is going to be greater than what God's done in the past. I believe that in a lot of ways, the temple is a, a template for the church. And, and, I, and I understand that, that, I think it's even Acts 17 talks about this, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that, that now because of the cross, because of grace, because of, of Calvary, because the veil being torn from top to bottom when Jesus died, that now the presence of the God is able to dwell and live in each side, inside of each one of us. And so we are the temple. I understand that. But I believe that God has called us to build a place that represents us to our city. I love this. The first Kings chapter nine. This is, this is what God thinks about the temple. And, and I believe that this is what God thinks about the local church. My name is stamped on it forever, God says. He says, listen, this thing that you do when you come together every week, it's not just about a building. It's not just about a location. It's not just about a couple of people getting together to, to, to say nice things to each other on Sunday morning and we sing some nice songs and we, and, and we play some nice music and, and we hear a good teaching about uh, that encourages us. It's, it's, not, it's about way more than that, that God has stamped his name on this thing. He says, forever. My eyes are on it and my heart is in it always. My eyes are on it and my heart is in it always. This is how God feels about the local church. And I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I believe that you have friends and family that will meet Jesus in our new location. And, and I believe that your, your kids and your teens and even maybe your grandkids will be discipled and will be brought up in the faith in our new location. And, and I believe that it's a place that is to be a presence hub and, and a healing hub and a creative hub so we can reach our city and that, that will not only impact just our city, but I believe as we begin to grow as a church and God begins to stamp us with his presence, it will impact our nation. It'll impact the world and you know what it may not be the fanciest church you've ever seen but I believe it will be marked by the spirit and the presence of God and God is building rebuilding something here in Asheville you see in Old Testament there there's a lot of references to wells and old wells and and they would redig old wells and they, I believe there are some old wells here in our city I believe there are some old things here in our city that have gone dormant for a while, but we have the opportunity to tap into some old wells because there's still life in those wells and, and there's still the presence of God is represented there. There's been some things happen in our city that have been amazing, but I believe the best is yet to come. And, and I believe there's, there's some stuff here. God is rebuilding something in Asheville and it may not look like what it used to, but I believe it'll be greater than what has ever been because Asheville shall be saved.